All right, we'll go on again. Started out being a creative writing in the Department of English and Creative, the Department of English and Creative Literature. Welcome to the memoir panel. We're here to um, talk about memoir. We've got Mary Carr, and we know Mary Carr, um, but I will just review. Take pictures of y'all. <laughs> She's written. Who she is. Oh. <laughs> uh, four uh, poetry collections, um, three memoir. Most of you have probably been digging into the memoir this week. I know my memoir students are here, and some of some of them were just in. They were the girls who promised to bring Mary some cheer wine. We did, but they were out. They were completely out. Oh, that's how popular it is. Those bastards. Y'all owe me cheer wine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. All right. I'm going to expect you to speak Presbyterian. Yeah. 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 Y
journal page in the Paris Review, in case you think I'm making this up. Uh, I was 1965, I was 10 years old, and I wrote, uh, when I grow up, I will write one half poetry and one half autobiography. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Well, I was touched by, I was touched, I guess is the other way <laughs> I'll say it. And um, beneath that I wrote, I'm not very successful as a little girl. <laughs> when I grow up, I will probably be a mess. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So I was kind of both doomed to write it, and uh, and I, I started teaching memoir in 1985 at Tufts, and um, so having I, not written, having not written any, and. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, it was a section I started in their composition program. So uh, I was an adjunct there. And um, I was always passionate about it. I loved a single voice. So. Do you think they asked you to teach memoir, having spent time with you and hearing your stories? They didn't ask me to teach memoir. They asked me to teach comp, and we were able to make a literary, <laughs> because I was a poet, they were able to make a literary uh, component out of it. So I. The first class I taught was a class of, of war memoirs called Modern Tough Guy Nonfiction. Um, and, uh, and then I taught a class that I later found a book with the same title, Running in the Family. Um, Michael Ondaatje has a great memoir called Running in the Family. And, uh, but at that time I thought I was being clever. So. Uh, I started thinking I was a poet and was dissuaded from that idea when I got to graduate school, um, and then began writing fiction. My first books were fiction. And then I lost my teaching job. I didn't have any work. And the, my sweetheart at the time was a builder. And he felt really, really sorry for me. And he offered me a job on a construction site. And um, and my job was to carry lumber. <laughs> um, I almost stepped on a copperhead. That was the most interesting thing that happened. <clears throat> but also, I, I got to do a little painting of trim work. And then he, he couldn't pay me but $10 an hour. So I had written a piece. I had gotten a call from my agent, and she um, there was an opportunity to write a piece of nonfiction. I had never written any. And it had to be about family, and it had to be about summertime. Those were the only stipulations. So I was paid more to write it than I was paid in advance for my first book. That was seductive. It was very seductive. Um, meanwhile, my sweetheart um, read this essay, and he thought it was better than my fiction. And he felt sorry for me because he couldn't pay me more than $10 an hour. And so he said he would pay me to write more of these pieces. You he sure did. That, you sure that's what he was paying you for? <laughs> <laughs> for the lumber, I was dropping and messing out. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. So um, he paid me two hundred dollars an essay. Jesus, Justin, Mary. <laughs> I didn't think they that. Yeah. So that's what I got. <laughs> um, so. Um, I have a bunch of questions, um, and, and we can just talk a little bit about, I have three actually that I think are, are the most interesting. And then after people have weighed in, please join the conversation and ask questions. Um, um, how important do you think content is to a memoir success? <laughs> I'll, say, I'll, I'll jump on it. Okay, Please okay. do. Thank you. How important so content is wise. to a memoir success? How important is content? To how good the memoir is, or how good it ends up doing in the marketplace? Both. Okay. Uh, for I mean, by content, I'm just going to say if the memoir doesn't have an extremely deep amount of story and truth and insight to it, then it's, a, it's not going to be very successful in terms of how good the book is. You know, you I don't see. In terms of how it, well it does in the marketplace, I think there's a phenomenon right now where you have these stunt books, not these stunt books, but stunt mm -hmm. books. The idea of, and some of them are extremely successful, but if you're Elizabeth Gilbert and you write in the first chapters of your book, here's my book proposal, I would like to go out 
experience an epiphany, uh, be a glutton, and then fall in love with a man. And then you go and do those things. It's not. I've been, doing, I've been doing those things my whole life. You know, just give me a nickel. For and you don't put the book proposal in like the first chapter of your book. That's the. That's the. That's the goal. Right. So the, that. She out earned all of us though. In fact, she still is. Crying all the way to the bank. Yeah, her and Julia Roberts. This little red convertible. Anyway, uh, so I mean, for me, that's you know, that doesn't demand or require all of that much content, even if there is. And Eat, Pray, Love has you know tons of great qualities to it. See, I don't think that's a great memoir. I I, uh, I would disagree. I mean, I, it's it's serviceably right. written, but I would say um, a great memoir is uh, Native Son, you know, Richard Wright, right. uh, or Woman Warrior, Maxine Hong Kingston, or Vladimir Nabokov, Speak Memory, and what or Michael Hare's Dispatches about the Vietnam War, or. Um, uh, Goodbye to all that uh, uh, about World War One. Um, I think what has to be extraordinary about a memoir is the voice. I think voice is central to its success or failure because you have to feel. And and by for me, success or failure is not selling a book that somebody reads one time. For my success, you have to reread the book. It's it's not. I want to give you double your money. <laughs> you know, I want to write books that are reread, and and um, so let's distinguish between a kind of soundbite memoir or I, I was a teenage sex slave memoir, um, and uh, you know, and uh, you know what I think of as a very highly literary memoir that has it creates a whole world in a way, say a novel would. Or so for my money, I think voice is the central thing, and if you. Frank Conroy's stop time, there's some interesting content there. You know, his father combed his hair with urine in a mental institution. Um, but that's one sentence of the book uh, that tells you something about wh where he came from. But what's really charming about that book is, is the voice. So you should feel like you know who the writer is, and the voice should be intimately tied up with what do you say to a student who <clears throat> is in a memoir class and says, I, you know, my life has been perfectly ordinary. Um, I don't have really anything spectacular to write about. I don't have anything, I don't have any interesting news. Mm -hmm. How would you help a student like that? Because tell them not to take a memoir. Class. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you take a memoir class if you're not haunted? I mean, it, because it meets at 10:30. I mean, I've seen, I met those too. Um, but I, I but does the, does that mean then that some lives aren't worth writing about? I, I just I don't think so. I, yeah, I, I, mean, I I've always said, as I said in your class yesterday, that I think the most privileged person in this room. The, person with the best family and the most money suffers the torments of the damned. Mm -hmm. Just being a human being. Mm -hmm. People you love are going to die. People <coughs> in your family are going to disappoint you. Even the people who love you most in the world are going to fail you. And they're going to be cruel to you. And you're going to fall in love and have your heart broken. And that's not the whole story of your lives. But uh, we all, everybody suffers. You know. Everybody suffers, right? I don't. <laughs> You're cuter than the rest of us. But I'm thinking of Eudora Welty, um, her famous statement, a sheltered life is a daring life as well. Mm. But then One Writer's Beginnings got a lot of flack right. because it was so mild. Well, I was going to say, that's a great example of a, of a life that a great people... voice. Yeah. Yeah, but a beautiful voice. Yeah, beautiful yeah, yeah, written. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I was thinking, a lot of people don't, there's a wonderful book, it's actually still in print. University of North Carolina Press published it. Uh, UNC is her, al what's her alma mater, Mary Mebbin. Her first book, she wrote two, maybe three. Uh, but the first book, Mebbin, was about growing up around here, mm -hmm. poor black girl. M-E-B-B-E-N? M-E-B-A-N-E, Mary Mebbin. And it's, uh, I mean, and not a lot happens. It, it's right. not, you know, there's no, it's just not like all over but the shouting and that, that sort of thing. But, um, but I think if you, if you have that question, then you probably not going to do it. You, just, you know, I, nothing's happened to me. Um, 
why, why bother writing about it? Then you, you, you've answered your question. But I think you can take all, I mean, you know, there's beautiful cookbooks about people who do nothing but garden. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> you know, exactly. And they make some of the most exquisite. Yeah, events um, don't have to be traumatic. You know, no. Writing they also don't have to be, one of, the, the sincere answer that I would give is that one of the most boring, flat, dull, almost purposeless, and given up on genres of literature is mountaineering writing. Alpine writing is incredibly flat, and you're like reading it, and he's Daring do is all over the page, and the, the writers can't do anything with it. You're like, you know, throwing it against the wall. You don't need to have these gigantic, you know, moments of where you're falling off a cliff and then you reach the top of Everest in your life in order to write something interesting. But you have to have this fantastic voice. You have to have this penetrating insight and talent for observation that you cultivate in yourself. That you're not just bestowed with genetically. I'm looking for, I'm not ignoring you, I'm looking for <laughs> a copy of Speak Memory. Um, just for those of you who haven't read the book, one, you should. Um, it's maybe my favorite book by Nabokov, my second being Penin, not Lolita. But um, he, his father, just to give you an example, they were living in Russia during, right before the revolution. They're very rich, very privileged family. So you think, what do these people have? He could describe, he fell in love with butterflies, and he could describe butterflies and, and this kind of elegant life he lived and building cushions over the back of the couch so there was a little tunnel that he went through in a way that is so lively and beautiful. His father was, they eventually had to flee Russia with none of their money um, from the revolution. His father was in the government, was one of the people who tried to start a new parliament and, and liberalize the czar. And he was assassinated and killed in Germany. Um, that's a minor piece of the book. That is less of the book than his writing about butterflies. And when you read it, it doesn't feel disproportionately wrong. You know how sometimes you read something and you're like, well, why are you only writing one sentence about this? <laughs> you know, because he manages to make the book not about, oh, how I have suffered, but about the development of a sensibility, the development of an, of a, an artist voice and, mm -hmm. and, and view of the world. Um, and that, to me, is one of the richest, most delicious uh, books I've ever read. I mean, I've read it a million times, and it, it never gets old to me. Um, OK, here's my other question. And we can come back to this. Um, memory, of course, is faulty, and we all know that. Um, what if you get something wrong and you're writing? Give an example of how wrong. <laughs> well, I mean, James Fry was right. Not in I want prison. you to talk about that. Yeah. yeah, I want you to talk a little bit about that because there's this quote um, that you uh, were responding to in a Paris Review interview, and. Um, you said it pissed me off when I saw James Fry on Larry King saying, you know, there's a lot of argument about the distinction between fiction and nonfiction. Um, that, that the lines were blurred. And Max at least bit blurred. Well, Max Steele, who taught here for years and founded this um, program, really, um, said that they were. He believed that they were. Well, poor Stuckey, and where yeah, is he right, now? Right, well, he's <laughs> not with us. But, um, going to live with Jesus. Well, so you're stuck lizard. with me. He, well, yeah, you can look at it that way. Um, but but he, um, he, used to, he used to be very proud of this fact that uh, an editor at the Washington Post magazine would call him up and ask for a piece of nonfiction. He would um, have a wonderful story lying around that he had in place anywhere, and he would doctor it up a little bit and send it off and sell it as nonfiction. That's cheating. And then when, yeah. when he was asked, but he would never really say until it was in print, you know. So, and it was written as if it was nonfiction. So, anyway. So, what do you think? Um, you, you have strong feelings about that. How do you feel? I feel the exact same way as Mary does, but I also have, uh, there is some hoaxing in my family. My grandfather once submitted, the only time he was published, he was a struggling poet, no, nothing to be more than just a poet, and he self-published volumes and volumes of verse. 
But he got one piece published. It was in the Harvard Business Review. It oh, was that's a, um, so sad. Yes, and it, <laughs> a poet it was in HBR. Yeah, and it was all he took uh, business jargon and constructed an article out of it that meant nothing. And he submitted it to the Harvard Business Journal. <laughs> and they accepted it. And he signed it for any Sherlock Holmes fans in the house. Uh, James Moriarty. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, hoaxing in that sense is fun and frivolous. Hoaxing in the James Fry sense is, uh, I mean, I just think it's cheap, it's crap, it's, if the, if the nonfiction writer, when confronted with a scenario or an interview or an event, can't find something interesting to extract from it, mm -hmm. then they need to move on. They don't just throw on, where's some of my students? We talked on the first day uh, about, you know, you've got a, someone, you're doing a scene and you're reporting it, and the person had a blue hat. What happens that a character later in the essay has a red hat, and you'd love to have this neat little connection between the two. So I just want to change it to a red hat. And I was like, no way. Mm -hmm. That's a blue hat. A blue hat's a blue hat. Mm -hmm. And you can't, if you think that's going to improve the drama, you're focusing your dramatic energies in the wrong place. Right. That's what I was right. No, the, yeah, go ahead. Brandon. No, what was, what, oh, God, what was his name? Um, he just came out with, uh, 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 he and his editor, uh, yes. did, uh, The Story of a Mountain. Was this, oh, the the guys crossed John the Gata, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm of several minds about it. Um, and I'll come back to what that was later, sorry. Um, but yeah, I mean, on, on the one hand, I think that nonfiction is nonfiction and should be, I mean, that's, it's, it's not, there's nothing like abstract about the concept of nonfiction. Or anything like that. It's not a lie, y'all. Uh, it is the truth. Uh, but then, you know, having started in fiction and been tantalized by the things you can do with facts and how you can really screw sure, people's minds. Sure, absolutely. Mind. Yeah. Uh, so I can sort of come to it with that sort of puppeteer notion initially. Right. But it's, I think it's very clear to differentiate between when you're doing that I, and I, when I'm putting myself in the story, yeah, you know, people, with wings. People, and, yeah, I mean, like Midnight in the Garden of Evil right. uh, was a very successful book before y'all were while y'all were busy being born. Um, <laughs> He admitted a whole character and he said that. Well, that seems fair to me. If you want to do that and say, I made this up, then go ahead. Then it's fiction. You know, I mean, but he's, you know, that's what he chose to do and he admitted it. And that's, it's about your relationship with your reader. And, and for my money, you're either kind of psychologically by your nature, as, as, uh, as you said, Marianne, you know, you, you were doing these nonfiction pieces and you just took to it. Mm -hmm. It's more natural for you to write out of your own experience. The way for a fiction writer, it would be truer. They would write more truly uh, mm -hmm. in fiction. Mm -hmm. I, I think what has happened and what people are responding to when they say that, it's not that they're complete big fat liars like James Fry, but that they are responding to the fact that in this century and starting late in the, you know, later or probably not 1870 or maybe even before that, in the 19th century, objective truth began to falter. People started reading in England, started reading the Bible, not as a prophetic text or the word of God, but as literature in which the prophets and Jesus and Moses and those people are characters. And they began to read it that way. And I think the minute they began to read it that way, there began to be an erosion of confidence in truth, in absolute truth, so that... Um, People stop going to church or temple or, or mosque or whatever. And so then there's a little, religion is not true anymore. It gets a little blurry. And then, and then uh, the president gets busted for lying about every damn thing he ever did uh, with Nixon in the, in the early 70s. So your government, so then it turns out that, that they fabricated body counts in Vietnam. And, and at the time that was happening, there was already in the public a sense that there was something, I knew people were in Vietnam and knew the body counts were fabricated. It was not a secret to me. Um, and so when Michael Hare, say, published this book, Dispatches, about Vietnam, which is one of the great memoirs, I think, of all time, it's this very, like, in Apocalypse Era, hallucinogenic, trippy, sex and drugs and rock and roll type voice. You don't read it for fact. You're reading it for this emotional experience. So I think there was a rise of power in, in people saying, I don't really know, but this is how I saw it. Right. So I think when Mary McCarthy published Memories, I'm fixing to shut up. 
published Memories of a Catholic Girlhood, uh, which she started publishing those essays in the New Yorker in the late 40s, published the book in the early 50s. Um, she apologizes at the beginning of each chapter and says, you know, I talked to my brother and he said the flu was not that year, it was this other year. And says that uh, uh, I, recon I have reconstructed dialogue. I did, wasn't taking notes and writing this dialogue. At the time she was publishing, people were angry with her for writing subjectively. Now you have a contract with the reader where the reader understands, you know, this is my interpretation. That said, I also give my manuscript to everybody who's in it before it goes out and give them the chance to say, no, bullshit, this didn't happen. And what's interesting to me is that they don't, that they really don't. That people see it as, oh, well, this is how my sister loved my grandmother, and I thought she was mean, and she made my mother cry. And my sister remembers this, this nice lady who tatted lace and this lacy old blue-eyed woman. Well, she didn't like me because I was tan all the time. She thought I looked Mexican. And they were all blonde in her family. So I was like this little, I looked like my daddy was half Indian. So. Maybe she just didn't like me, or maybe she had a tumor in her head the size of a grapefruit, and which she, she in fact did, and so she was not, so she was not, or, or maybe uh, she was an asshole, I don't know, but from my point of view, I perceived it in this way, and you as readers, when I say in my last book that I wanted to run my husband over in the car when he was moving the garbage cans, I don't think anybody thinks he deserved that. I think people understand that I'm seeing him from this particular point of view. And, uh, you know, I look like the one who's not quite all there. So um, most of my indictments in my memoirs are self-indictments. I try not to indict. Um, has anyone ever written anything that anyone disputed? I um, had this, this Paris book uh, there was an excerpt in a magazine, and one of the guys who's a character in the book, who's a real colleague of mine, lives over in uh, Paris, is a uh, Scottish copywriter, whose real name is Trevor, and the book he's called Keith, and I changed the names and the reasons at the publisher that they wanted to do that. Anyway, he writes me on Facebook, <coughs> writing memoir, nonfiction, whatever, I think has got to be very different in the era of Facebook when all these people can come back and find you. <laughs> yeah. This is happening. Anyway. He emails me over Facebook and he says, so, who's this Keith? That was the whole, that was the whole email. So I write back, you know, like 16 paragraphs. Oh, dear Trevor, I must let you know about this book. I worked so hard to make it accurate. I have all these notes about these conversations that you and I had. I would love to get your feedback if something does not seem accurate to what you said. He writes back, dude, I'm not talking about that. You could have made the whole thing up. I don't give a shit. Uh, the important thing is that you create something entertaining for 10,000 people and not care about us, you know, 10 people that are in the book. Now, I disagree with that. But anyway, he continues. He says, no, my problem is with the fact that I am called Keith because the last time I saw Keith in literature was in Martin Amos's The Information, and he is a serial killing fuckhead. And now I am the next Keith to come along, and I have had some input. I said, no, it's a little I late. Let, I let people pick their names. Oh, I let people pick their pseudonyms. It's one of the things I've I did that. I did that for two people. The other people, I was like, oh, I feel weird. <laughs> well, I, I had a, 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 an experience, but it was family oriented, and I hadn't let anybody vet it before uh, before they uh, read it. And um, I used to ride horses, and I, I was in a horse show once, and my mother had come to the horse show. My mother was the complete flip of your mother. Um, Thank God. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but that was. That was my luck in life. Um, and my mother um, was up in the grandstand, but you know how you are in, when you're in junior high and you, um, ever, anything your mother does just totally grosses you out. Grosses you out. You know, they're just horrible. Watch me eat an life. apple as well. Oh. <laughs> so my mother has come to the horse show in a gi gigantic flying saucer of a hat. Oh, mother. All right. Then giant glasses, sunglasses. Um, Jackie O. Sunglasses. Well, Jackie O, but probably more like Audrey Hepburn, you know, mm -hmm. those giant things. And so she's up in the grandstand, and the horse refuses the, the hurdle and rears up, and my mother stands up and she yells, 
get off that horse! You know, the whole, everything. Who did it? And of course I'm not going to listen to her. I'm furious. And so, I'm going to make my horse jump. I'm not going to do this. We head towards the jump again. The horse rears up again. She stands up and she screams, get off that damn horse right this minute! <laughs> so, I put all this in, in I, I take the jump and I win fourth place anyway, despite her. Uh, so I put this in the book and um, my mother reads it and she calls me up and she says, I have a bone to pick with you. And I said, what is it? And she said, I did not curse in public. I would not have done that. I would have never cursed in public. I said, you did, you did. No, faulty memory, faulty memory. Who, who, there's probably a lot more wrong with this book. So <laughs> she read it very, very closely after that. That was the only thing she got. So I'm at a library reading, and I'm reading this passage, and I give a little anecdote about how mad it made my mother for me to out her in the book. This woman's hand goes up at the back of the room when I'm done, and she says, I was there. My name is Marjorie Hoffman. Remember me? <laughs> yes, Marjorie. I was there, and she did stand up, and she did cuss in public. <laughs> so I, after that, you know, that like I'm golden, my memory, you know? I'm, I'm like not to be disputed. <laughs> I'm amazed at, that I haven't had dispute. Um, I have one correction from Tobias Wolf, and I still think, that he's lying. <laughs> I don't. I don't just think that that I got I got it wrong because I'd actually written the story to my sister in a letter, and she has the letter. And the story is this. So it's not this way in lit, but you're hearing it here first. I said, Toby, I don't give a shit. If that makes you feel better, I'll take it out. Um. So and I will cuss it. <laughs> um, so yes. <laughs> no, I can't help it. I'm sorry. That's I apologize. Okay. My daddy, it's refreshing. My daddy gave me money to cuss when I was little, and I don't know how to stop. <laughs> um, when he was at Oxford, he t he was uh, Toby was my godfather in the Catholic Church. I converted to Catholicism, having been an atheist my whole life, about 15 years ago. And uh, when Toby was at Oxford, when I was in graduate school, I heard this story. Toby and four of his friends in Oxford, at that time there's a very famous philosopher there named Hannah Arendt. Two of these guys were students of Hannah Arendt. And, um, and they go to hear, they go to this, Mother Teresa is coming to speak, and they go to heckle Mother Teresa. <laughs> <laughs> they get drunk, they go to a pub in the afternoon, they, do. they get drunk, as you do, and they go to heckle Mother Teresa. And I remember saying to him, uh, Really? I said, uh, well, what happened? He said, well, it was clear right away who the assholes were. <laughs> he said, everybody said to me, you know, everybody just said, shut up, you know, and then everything went on as normal. Well, of those five people, four converted to Catholicism within the year. Now, this is a very dramatic story, yes. right? I, I did not make this story up. I wrote my sister a letter in which, in which this story appeared. So I send the manuscript to Toby because he sent it. He's like, I never heckled Mother Teresa. His <laughs> super Catholic wife is on the phone, but she has two brothers who are priests. I said, well, maybe it's a joke that like Ray and, and Jeffrey, his brother, Ray Carver and Jeffrey Wolf, told me when I was a graduate student at the time. Maybe they framed it that way, but I, I remember this story. You know, I've written a well note. I said, okay, if it makes you feel better, I'll, I'll take it out. But I really think he's a big fat liar. <laughs> Maybe he didn't do it, but he certainly told me that he did. So, in terms of veracity, again, it's not about what happened. It's not an act of history. Historians, who are supposed to be objective, have stopped just writing as though they know the truth. They've started doing these positioning, what they call positioning papers, or positioning essays at the beginning of, of books of history. If you read Robert Kiros, any of his great, but uh, certainly his first biographies, he has a four volume set on Lyndon Johnson. Um, they're really great books. He pretty much starts out by saying, you know, I, I worship this guy. He was the first man to get civil rights legislation uh, pushed through. There was a hundred year uh, gap 
they couldn't get any civil rights publication passed at all because of something called the Southern Bloc in, in, in Congress for a hundred years. The last civil rights legislation had been to stop slavery. And they couldn't, they couldn't make lynching a federal crime. So I always, he said, I always admired him for this. And, I always, and then he gets to know him, and he learns all these horrible things about him. And, and he's almost saying at the beginning of the book, you know, I'm not sure how objective I am in this book. But again, I think you, readers understand now, and they value the subjective in a way they used to value the objective. So readers understand we're reconstructing dialogue. They understand we're te probably telescoping time. We're not putting in every single thing we remember that happened. We're, we're only, as you say, and the minute you start shaping a narrative, I figured out very early in the Liars Club that if I have my mother throw, she made me a lasagna on my birthday, if I ever get mad at my daddy and throw the lasagna at him when he walks out the back door so it splatters on the, they think she's a jerk. And if I put her cleaning it up, they feel better about it. So where do you stop the story, right? You don't put in that she went out and cleaned it up and then gave me a little, a little candle in my burger or whatever it was. You don't see, you don't add that. As soon as you start leaving things in, and so in that sense, of course it's a corrupt form and in the sense that your imagination and memory inform each other. But just don't make up stuff that happened. You know, it's not, I don't think the rules of truth I think one reason memoir has been able to flourish is that we're able to use novelistic devices like reconstructed language or, or I'm describing something in a scene that I probably wasn't noticing at that moment because I'm trying to give the reader a sense of what the room looked like to make the, the experience real. So the minute I'm doing that, I'm lying in a sense. But, um, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, oh yeah, like, well that's, I mean, for me... How about Hallelujah? Hallelujah! Creative <laughs> <laughs> nonfiction is the best because you get to show and you get to tell. You just said that the other day. Right. Um, you get all the tools that fiction writers use, but you get you don't have to, like, rack your brain trying to extract it all out of your imagination. It's there if you can use it. And, and it's, and, and memory selected. Alan's got a question. Yeah. All of you talked about, I know that three of you have written fiction and one poetry. I've never written fiction. I know. You tried that. I tried and I couldn't. But when you, why is it that when you write memoir, people want to know what you've made up, and when you write fiction, they want to know <laughs> it's real. Yeah, that's a very good, that's a great. Why do you think, Alan? I have no idea. Yes, you do. <laughs> if you've encountered that, that people laugh. Don't they ask you what's true? <laughs> even worse, even worse. They assume it's true. Well, but they assume the, fi the fiction is true. Yeah, right. Yes, exactly. That, then that drives me yeah. crazy. Yeah. Uh, especially with members of my family. It's like, yes. I remember when that happened. It's like, no, you didn't, because right. I made it up. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. It's like, that, yeah, I, it's, it's fascinating how, how the mind, mind works like that. Yeah. yeah, you write a novel, and everyone that you know, friends, family, third degree Facebook, is like, you know, you didn't talk to me beforehand, but it's cool. I don't mind you using it. <laughs> you know, like, what are you talking about? We met at a diner one time. You're not in my book. But everyone. But, but I've known people who've written bad things, based something that they're going to put into fiction on a real person they knew who was horrible, incorrigible, and they put the person in pretty much like they were, exactly. and the person does not recognize themselves. Right. Example, Jeffrey Eugenides, uh, What's the name of that? It's a terrific novel. What's the name of that novel? The new one's plot. The new one, the marriage the plot. The marriage plot. The marriage plot. plot. Um, <laughs> describes a guy exactly like David Foster Wallace physically. The guy is also a philosophy major, as was David. This guy is nothing like David. I knew David. He couldn't be less like David. He's a. He's a. David wasn't that interested in anybody else, you know. This guy is very codependent, worried what his girlfriend thinks and, and all of this, and that, that just wasn't. And Jeffrey kept saying to everybody that, to all the reporters, that's not David Foster Wallace. It's a guy with a headband and big boots and, you know, this kind of T-shirt. Yeah, but that's a bandana. coy response. That is, Jeffrey knew exactly what he was doing when he got into Of course he did. If you put a bandana around someone's forehead who is of the same generation and everyone knows that they knew each other and he shows up, you know. 
New York Magazine is going to have a great time for six months with that. <laughs> yeah, but those are the, you know, the fiction writers are the ones who get sued. Yeah. Memoirists don't get sued. That's the interesting thing. Think about it. You're going to write a memoir and you're going to publish it, and everybody you eat Thanksgiving dinner with is going to read something you made up. My people are armed. <laughs> my, people are, my people are from Texas. I remember Juno Diaz saying that. He's like, why would you make up something that people who were there, I mean, think about it. It's not really a, a very smart thing to do. <laughs> you know, these people, my people would say, that never happened. You know, I mean. Well, do you think that, um, I mean, you have to have a story whether you're writing fiction or memoir. Yes. But when you're writing memoir, you're telling the story under oath. Mm -hmm. Fiction, yes. you're not telling it under oath. Right. I mean, that's. And I always say that um, you might remember externally what happened be even better than I do. You don't remember how I felt. Exactly. That's true. You don't remember how I, re I am the expert on how I feel. So I try to make the plot or the story <coughs> be tethered to a psychological or emotional change in me. So the enemy is not external. The enemy is an aspect of the, the speaker's self of the protagonist's self. It's a psychological or inner uh, development in terms of story. So, and, and the other thing I do that I think has made people more willing for me to write about them is I don't speculate on motive. I really try not to say, she was jealous of me and she blah, 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 blah. You know, I'll say something like, I don't say my mother's an alcoholic. I say, I watched her drink and I, we would take the vodka bottles out from under the sink and pour them down. The, you know, the, her drinking bothers me. That, I'm, not, I'm not interpreting for people you know, how they felt. I do that for myself. So the, nobody ever thinks about the interior life in the memoir. And I think the interior life has to be very large, I think. Like you said, the way of looking at the world and interpreting things and being curious about stuff and observing and wondering and imagining. Well, it's the filter of self, which you've written right. about, too. Right? Yeah. And that's what individualizes it as much as any story that you write. Right. Tell.